Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Waterston. I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, if I haven't met you, but there are many familiar faces in the room, so I feel like I'm with old friends. Can I introduce the two former deans uh, who are with us tonight? Uh, Emeritus Dean Field Rickard and uh, former Dean and Vice-Chancellor of the University, um, Kwong Lee Dow. Welcome them both along. <laughs> Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respect <coughs> to Elders past and present, um, and extend that uh, respect to Indigenous people present. And I also acknowledge the place of Indigenous knowledges in the Academy. Okay, we've got a very exciting night tonight. So exciting that I put a tie on, Sandra. So, um, we do have one problem tonight, though, Sandra, because I, we have this formula, Yvette and I, about how we figure out how big the crowd's going to be. So, we had about um, 270 register, and we usually halve it, and then we know what the crowd's going to be like. But so many people have come to hear you speak tonight that we're going to have to use some of your speaker fee for the bar that went over the tab. So, <laughs> but anyway. Um, Okay, well, it's a very exciting evening. We, 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 it's my job to introduce um, Professor Sandra Milligan. Um, it, it, is a, it is a great privilege. Sandra and I spent a lot of time talking. The reason I wanted to become a dean, I, I wasn't in an academic pathway to get to this job. Um, I'm sure it surprised a lot of people. But what, what, what intrigued me in, in my life um, working in schools and school systems is that I didn't always see the translation of research into schools. It's not because uh, academics couldn't do it, it's just sometimes school teachers are time poor and uh, they rush around trying to, trying to fix everything at once. And I thought, I wonder if I could go into a university and see if we could make a difference. Well, um, fortunately or unfortunately, I came to the right university. There's lots of translation and there's lots of focus on work that goes into schools, but none more than Sandra Milligan. And so um, her work is exactly the kind of work that I... Uh, was thinking about when I was working in school systems. It is focused on schools, it is focused on um, leaders and teachers and um, she knows what that work's about and um, you're going to be delighted with what you hear tonight. I, I do want to say before we start, uh, Sandra's work is, is right in the perfect place for this post-pandemic period that we go forward. I'm going to read an official welcome but, but I just want to um, talk a little bit about um, her focus on equity. You know, we, we, we live in a, a work in a very privileged university where we have the brightest of the students that are available that come to us and, and, and they're brilliant and, and they go on and they help, you know, deal with this equity issue in, the, in, in terms of going into schools. But Sandra's work is really about equity and it really is about trying to give everyone a fair go and um, focus on fairness for young people. And, and when I say fairness, you know, we, we've got great schools right throughout the country, right through metropolitan, regional and remote areas. But the fairness really comes down to two isolated numbers, really, and, and those numbers are your ATAR and your um, postcode. And, and if you really want to spend the time and go through the data and look at NAPLAN and look at PISA, you'll find that it really is about the postcode. Some, some students perform outside their postcode, but if you live in a high SES area, you've got a way better chance. And if, if you are in that SES area and you're in a great school and your parents have, have got enough money to send you to an even greater school, then, then it's more likely that you're going to do well. So Sandra's work is directly aimed at making sure that we find out about young people that's more than just four test scores when they're 17 or 18. I, I moved to Victoria when I was 2005 and I have never stopped meeting people my age, old people, who, um, who, who first of all tell me about their enter score or their, back in our day it was the, the TEE or, or whatever and so it's a real badge of honour in Victoria that, that when you're 17 or 18 you've got this score that, that somehow or other is going to um, gratify you for the rest of your life. There are lots of young people who don't get that chance and they're, and they're able and they're capable and they, and they could do that. So Sandra's work is really about making sure that, um, that we are not just a test score. And, and I'll leave the rest of it for her tonight. But, but that is, that is um, probably the greatest gift that we can give to schools is to figure out ways that we can deal with the whole person, understand the capabilities that they have in, in terms of, and their academic um, capacity, and all of the other things that make those people unique. And every young person needs to be recognised for who they are. 
And we don't always do that right, I think, in, in the current education system. So it intrigues me when we've got a new um, federal minister, Jason Clare, who's looking to innovate and to bring people together and develop a, a, an Australian plan. He needs to talk to people like Sandra because, it, because the work is about making sure that everyone gets a fair shot at this. It, you know, brains are distributed e equally, but, um, but opportunity isn't. And, and we just need to make sure that everyone gets the opportunity. I'm tempted to say I, I wouldn't have got into this university when I was 17. Um, anyway, I'm the dean now, so look what happened. <laughs> but, 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 it, but it goes to show that we've, we've, you know, it's, it's a lifelong journey and education is, is hopefully for the whole of your life. And, and again, I won't keep talking about what Sandra's going to say, but, but I am um, absolutely captivated with the way she goes about the work, the team she's put around her and the impact that she's making in schools right across this nation. So I am truly delighted to welcome one of our own Mel Melbourne Graduate School of Education experts, Professor Sandra Milligan. By way of formal introduction for those who are not as familiar with Sandra's work, Professor Milligan is the Director of the Assessment Research Centre here at MGSC. Originally a teacher in a, uh, of science and mathematics, Professor Milligan is also a former Director of Curriculum in an Australian State Education Department. Now I have to stop there because I know that you wrote this. Why wouldn't you put in there that you're from Western Australia? <laughs> I'm from Western Australia. That's it. <laughs> We're both from Western Australia. And let me say that, um, I don't want to talk about age, but uh, when I was a very young um, principal, um, I went along to the department to um, see the superintendent of education. And I don't know if, if you realise, but in those days, they were beyond gods. And so you didn't sort of talk to them and you, and you just stood there and, and took as many notes as you could. So Sandra would talk about curriculum. She was also the director of curriculum prior to that. And I was just so in awe, and, and as a principal of 35 students with my wife as the only other teacher there, so I wasn't even the smartest person in the school. Um, and so when I, went, when I went and listened to Sandra talk about what good education looks like and what curriculum um, should, be, should be used for and how it can be the, 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 the basis of equity for young people if, if everyone gets an opportunity to engage with it, changed my life. So I, I say that honestly. And, and, and I really realised from that moment on, if I was going to do something, I had to go back and rethink everything about uh, what education needed to be. And so I'm thrilled at the, at the sort of end of my career to still be engaging with Sandra about some of those very issues. Um, let me move on before this takes too long. Professor Milligan has an unusually wide engagement with the education industry and in educational research. Her current research interests focus on assessment, recognition and warranting of hard to assess learning. She directs several, learning, uh, re several research partnerships with school networks and organisations working to develop learner profiles for their students. The bit I talked about before, giving everyone status uh, when they go out to look for further opportunities. Professor Milligan is a lead author of Future Proofing Australian Students with New Credentials report, outlining methods to reliably assess and recognise the level of attainment of general capabilities, as well as the author of Recognition of Learning Success for All ensuring trust and utility in a new approach to recognition of learning in senior education in Australia. Very long title, but um, it's, it's, it's a great read. In June this year, Professor Milligan and the Big Picture Project team were awarded an MGSE Award for Excellence in Social Inclusion, recognising their outstanding contribution toward achieving graduate school's goals in the areas of equity, diversity and inclusion. Building on 20 years of ARC innovation, the Big Picture Project team designed and validated the International Big Picture Learning Credential, a credential which accurately and reliably represents learner proficiency and enables universities and employers to distinguish between students of different abilities in non-standardised contexts. The focus on inclusion and wellbeing within big picture education makes it particularly attractive to students who are not succeeding in the mainstream <coughs> education system. And as we come out of COVID, there are more and more of those students. Earlier in the year, Professor Milligan also won the ACL Victoria Headley Bear Educator of the Year Award at the ACL Annual Branch Award Ceremony, where she gave the Headley Bear oration to an audience of Australia's premier education leaders. It is a testament to Sandra's reputation to see so many MGSE colleagues, friends and followers here tonight. So without further ado, could you please join me in welcoming Enterprise Professor Sandra Milligan to the stage. <laughs> Her presentation, more than a mark, how to measure the learning success without ranks and tests. Thank you, Sandra. Okay. 
Oh, gosh, Tim, what can I say? After that, I don't think I've got anywhere to go. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Jim. Um, and can I just echo the um, acknowledgement of the, that we're meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people that have never been ceded and pay our respects to Elders uh, past and present. I'd also like to pay respects to the deans <laughs> of the faculty at the um, dean's lecture. Jim, um, I, I cannot tell you how terrific it is working at an institution like this, MGSE, Melbourne University, it adds weight and heft to whatever we do. And so it's a huge pleasure for me. You said um, when you're talking about me that I've had an unusually wide experience in education. I sort of have in all sorts of institutions and I can tell you that this one is rolled gold. So it's been a great pleasure um, to be working here. I blame uh, Field as the dean who appointed me. <laughs> And um, I've been a huge admirer also of Kwong, so it's, a, it's a quite daunting to have three deans uh, in the dean's lecture. Um, and before I get started, I also want to acknowledge the presence of quite a lot of people in the audience who I call first movers. Those of you who don't um, know much about the ARC may not realise that it's not unusual for us to have to pay for our own drinks. <laughs> um, we're an enterprise unit, which means that we're, we are assessed on our impact on the industry. We more or less have to make our own living. And we do that by trying, to, as far as we can, to help solve practical uh, problems that the industry faces. The way we do that all the time is that we work with those industry practitioners who have the problem. Here's a slide full of the ones that we're working with in um, 2022. We work with these practitioners because they say they've got a problem, often a wicked problem, that they want to work with us. They provide the practical expertise. They provide the practical wisdom. They provide the practical problem. We provide the research, the techniques and the tools and to, as partners we work together. Now there are a number of people here tonight from those um, partnerships and there are I think at least four of our new metric schools here which, and I'd very much like to welcome you. Um, this is just from having scanned down the guest list but I think there's Wesley and Genazano and Carians and Michael so um, thank you very much for coming. There are our industry partners, I, I can see Tanya Smith um, I think Ellen Koshland's going to be in the audience from um, the All Learning Lecture. Um, we've got Mastery Transcript people, we've got Big Picture people. All of those people, um, the work I'm talking about tonight is our work, not my work or the work of just my staff in the centre, it's our work. So um, in welcoming all our partners here tonight, I'm sort of, uh, I very much hope that I can represent your work in the best possible way because it is genuinely our work. Um, now, let, let's get cracking. So, what's the problem? I said we're always working on industry problems. What is the problem? Let me start by asking you to reflect what a parent would say as they, they drop their five-year-old at the gate, first day at school, what do they want out of school for that child? What would a, would a young teenager say as they make their first trip from the little primary school to the big secondary school? What are their hopes and aspirations as they walk into that school? What do employers want when a sort of raw recruit from a school or a university stands in front of them, what, what are they hoping that this um, raw recruit will know and be able to do and who they might be? Well, I can tell you what, uh, we've talked to a lot of people about that. 
and very few of them say things like, I want to ace the year four NAPLAN, <laughs> or I want eight <coughs> in physics in the VCE, or things like that. Um, they typically talk about things like, um, um, you know, that for the younger kids, gosh, I hope they're going to be happy at school. I hope they're going to make friends and that maybe these friends will carry them through. They might say, as they get a bit older, I hope, I hope they learn to become good school citizens and citizens in the wider community that they have. I hope they become a good person, a good person. I hope that they come out of school confident and capable of being able to make their way in life. The employers even don't say, uh, typically, you know, I need you to have done 60% in French or something like that. They say, well, I want you to be able to fit into the company. I want you to be a good team worker. I want you to come on time and be dependable. They talk about things like that. And um, so they're the sorts of things that people talk about. What I've got here is some representations of that idea that are very common in schools and have been over the last little while. Um, some of those I'm sure you reckon. Look at a UOM graduate. Really cool, hey. Have you looked at a degree certificate? To what degree does that degree certificate say any of that? In fact, when most employers have a graduate in front of them, what they're actually thinking is, I wonder if this person knows anything worth knowing. <laughs> Am I being a bit rough? <laughs> anyway, um, the one down here that looks like planets, that's the ACARA general capabilities descriptions that are now built into the K-10 curriculum. So all I'm saying is these things that parents and employers and the kids want, they're already in our curriculum um, to some degree. The beautiful colour one is the IB learner <coughs> profile, very popular with parents, the idea that they're going to produce learners that have broad um, activities. And so we go. Um, that one up there in the left-hand corner is um, the World Economic Forum which influences what employers say and want. Now, these sorts of inclusions in the curriculum have um, been uh, argued for the last 30 years, although they only started popping up in school curriculum about, what, a decade or so ago with the general capabilities. Um, but the, the desire to have them included in the formal curriculum uh, has certainly been a, a, a long-standing and increasing uh, trend in Australian education at all levels. Some of you might remember the Maya competencies, which I think were the first ones that sort of hit the scene. But this, sort of, this group of reports that I've got there includes the Gonski report, the Shergold report, which was just a little while ago, uh, the Masters report, the review of senior second of uh, curriculum in New South Wales. They're all saying the same thing. Let's represent a broader curriculum to reflect what it is that people want out of schools. Um, this slide here um, reflects, uh, it's a pretty simplistic view, but it's my summary view of the major shifts that we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years, um, and certainly we're seeing it increasingly <coughs> in the last 10, about what should be included in the curriculum. The green are the things that were really embedded very strongly in the 20th century. That's the subjects, the disciplines, the domain knowledge that are the core of our curriculum at all levels, um, plus literacy and numeracy. Um, the domain skills covers everything from learning how to unblock a, a, a drain if you're in a um, VET course, through to learning how to solve a quadratic equation if you're in secondary. Um, 
but it's that other side, the blue side, that people are now concentrating on. So they're talking about the personal virtues, reliability, integrity, honesty, um, the social skills, collaboration, citizenship, the interpersonal skills, communication, um, the purposefulness, you know, planning, decision making, being able to do things. And um, these are generally called general capabilities, 21st century skills, transversal skills, you name it. I'm going to refer to them as general capabilities as on block tonight, just for um, um, sort of uh, simplicity. And here's how these things are playing out in the current um, sort of policy debates and issues that are happening in Australia. I think, um, by and large, people are pretty... Uh, well, the Australian K-10 curriculum's just been reviewed and the general capabilities are still there. But in senior secondary, where we do not have a curriculum, there's now a uh, discussion about whether these things should be formally included in the, in the curriculum, and I've got that in the second column there. Um, some education authorities, and I'm thinking in particular here of the South Australian SACE board, have actually implemented a large program where they're putting these general capabilities slap bang in the middle of the SACE certificate, um, arguing that these are the skills that, and that will enable their graduates to thrive. Anyway, I, I could keep on going. The main theme is that increasingly these general capabilities are considered to be important learning goals th right through the curriculum, K25. They uh, should be taught, they should be assessed and even credentialed. I'm not saying, um, I'm very conscious of um, Tanya Smith down here who's doing some consultations with us. So I would be the first to say that we, um, it's not um, universal that that should happen, but, uh, but there we go. Now, I finally got to the question of what the problem is. So that's just all by way of background. Here's the problem. What they tell us is that as first movers, they've pretty well accepted that this, these sorts of capabilities should be in their curriculum. Many of them have re renewed and revamped their curriculum, their learning designs, their pedagogy, their messaging, so that students are more and more are able to learn and be taught these sorts of capabilities. But pretty soon, they bump into a roadblock. And what is that roadblock? It's that, and I, I think I'm not un overstating this, all the formal learning metrics that shape what people think of as success in our schools, all of them are focused on that 20th century view of subject, domain and basic skills. I'm talking here in the junior primary of phonics. I'm talking about NAPLAN. I'm even probably talking about the Friday tests that teachers <coughs> might do. I'm talking about PISA, Tims and Pearls, that tell us how su successful we are as a country. I'm talking about the standardised tests that are available um, around a place like Fontas and Pennell. I'm too scared to say Pat, because <laughs> I can see there are people from ACR here. Um, so, <laughs> um, but these uh, standardised tests are um, ubiquitous. Up in the secondary school, it's NAPLAN, it's VCE examinations, it's ATAR. By the time you get to tertiary ed institutions, it's LANTITE. It's the ubiquitous essay. Um, it's those kinds of things. And these things, these, um, I'll call them assessments, these assessments are the things that people define as success in our schools. Um, so 
you know, student, if you ask a year 12 student at the end of the year how'd they go, many of them will say 82. <laughs> really? Your whole 12 years and you've got, you, were, you are 82? They don't believe that. They know they are more than their ATAR. Um, I, I think also, so y you pity those poor kids who know that they are far more than just their GPA or their scores, but they've got nothing to show what they can do, who they are, what they, and, you know, what, who they are and can be. They've got nothing to show. It's still only about 50% of our Year 12 cohort who actually go, can go out with a certificate that even purports to tell them, tell people what they did for their 12 years. Um, I, I've already talked about, you know, pity parents as well. Like many, many parents know that the VCE and the ATAR and the NAPLAN are not the best things building the confidence of their children. But what choice do they have when they're the only things that people measure success by? Now, um, I, I remember when I was talking to one of our um, new metrics principals, principal of a primary school, who's been working for 15 years to build agency, learner agency, in the cohort of, of um, children in her school. And she said, we've been working at this for 15 years. We actually know that our kids are brilliant and that they are self-determining learners who will competently and capably and confidently um, be able to manage their own learning. But we can't prove it. There is no um, metric that we can use to show even ourselves, although we believe it, even ourselves, that we're actually really kicking some goals here with these kids. And the parents, therefore, don't have anything to look at either. So um, the, problem we're face the problem we have accepted through the new metrics projects and with our credentialing partners is to say, can we? establish a new set of metrics that really represent in the broad um, uh, richness of what students know and can do, can we represent that through our assessments, through our reports and through our credentials? That's our goal. All right? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that journey that we're on. Um, so our approach to this challenge. The first thing is what are these things called general capabilities? Because there's a fair bit of um, overclaim, we think, and a fair bit of wooliness about what general capabilities might be. If I can just pick a couple of examples. I've got there, the first word up there is these general capabilities need to be transferable. Now, what that means is it doesn't matter where you learnt them. You might have learnt them in your maths cl class. You might have learnt them in your um, footy team. You might have learnt them anywhere, but you take them with you when you move on. It's not specific. A really good example of this is problem solving, because this really confuses people. Often teachers think that problem solving is things like solving quadratic equations, balancing chemical equations, uh, understanding what caused the French Revolution, you know, these problems that we have defined within the domains of knowledge. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about when we're talking about the, the general capability of problem solving is that general orientation to solving a problem that, that employers talk about, which they know comes with the person not their specific knowledge. Like if you see a live wire on the ground, do you just walk past it and don't pretend you, you see it? Or do you take responsibility for actually solving problems that are in the world? 
Um, do you just leap in and possibly electrocute yourself or do you take a considered view of how to solve this problem, etc.? So it's those general skills that we're talking about and it's really important to make sure we, we're distinguishing be, between things like solving quad, uh, quadratic equations, which is a specific problem solving skill, and these general capabilities. We also often get asked to uh, assess things like creativity or well-being. And we say, no, no, they're not suitable curriculum objects. You might be able to teach well-being skills that will enable a person to uh, have the skills, attitudes and values that might help them if they've got well-being challenges. But no school can ensure the total well-being and it's not a curriculum objective. The curriculum objective is the well-being skills. With creativity, that's a bit like beauty. People don't seem to agree about it and if you can't agree about it, you can't assess it. So we try and narrow down to those teachable, accessible, learnable, uh, transferable skills that are legitimate parts of the curriculum. And we're trying to develop, we are trying, we are developing metrics to do those. Um, the other point about this little um, definition, <laughs> construable as competence. This is the other big challenge when we're talking about general capabilities. I'm going to have a little moan about the OECD um, in respect of this particular point. In 2018, they conducted an assessment of global competence, you know, as they do all around the world to give us nice rankings of which countries do well on this. What they actually tested was knowledge about global competence, which is a really big difference. Ditto with uh, intercultural capability. Often it will be, if it, I mean, the, the classic example is if it's a pen and paper test, it is not assessing competence. That makes sense, doesn't it? So what we've got to remember here is that we're, if we're developing new metrics that go to competence, they just can't be written. They've got to be performance-based. So um, th this little definition of competence is very helpful for us. The next thing we've got to know is, OK, so we've got these definitions, global competence. What does learning global competence actually look like, all right? Because unless you know what learning looks like, you can't teach it and you can't assess it. So here is um, the Dreyfus and Dreyfus taxonomy, which is certainly my Bible um, for, when ha for understanding how you can represent competence. The um, key to it is that if you're thinking about the development of competence in a domain, you don't have to think of the 101,000 things that a person's got to learn to become an expert. All you've got to understand is that it's possible to um, sort of identify marked leaps, qualitative leaps in, comp in um, competence. And that if you can understand those leaps, you've got a fair enough gist about what learning in an area of competent, competence would be. Um, my my favourite example that the Dreyfus brothers use um, is jazz musicianship. You know, if you're a beginner, you focus all the time on getting the notes right, okay, and learning your scales. That's a beginner. By the time you develop up to become uh, competent, you can probably play some tunes pretty well and people can tap along with you. After you've got that under your belt, you proceed to the next level where 
you're so comfortable with the basics of playing tunes that the emotion comes in, the capacity to improvise comes in and you've gone up a level in your capacity to play jazz. The next one is you can not only improvise, you can probably jam with others so that the playing with the others lifts the whole community in terms of their musicianship. So what the Dreyfus brothers are saying, you've got to look for those lifts. That's the key to be able to understand um, the development of competence. And if you know what these lifts are, it's easy to recognise. Now, as, as with jazz, so with general competencies. So look at this. This is, a, um, this is a lift, a series of lifts that we developed for uh, the Philippines Education Department who have 3.5 million kids who should be in school who aren't. And they, want to, they, want to, they explored with us the feasibility of developing a credentialing system that recognised general capabilities for these kids. And talking to the employers and the teachers and the students, these were the lifts we came up with for um, teamwork and cooperation. And I, I, well, you can read that yourself. I mean, at the, at the bottom level, you're basically, you do as you're told in the team. At the very top level, you're the person who shapes the environment so that everyone else can do their job and lift the whole community. So um, th this was found, this uh, progression, this is called a progression, obviously, was found to be very useful for employers and for students and for teachers because suddenly they could see what increasing competence would look like. Um, the, the levels, the descriptions of the levels in this approach to assessment are called standards. So there's not one standard. It's, um, there are, in this progression, there are five standards. By definition, there's no such thing as failure. You're just on your journey from standard to standard. And in fact, um, you know, some employers um, are looking for people don't mind if they're at level one and two. Others want uh, students at levels three and four. So being at a particular level is just a step on your journey, but it helps people match what you know and can do with where you might want to go. Is that making sense? Are you with me so far? Yes. Yeah, okay, with me. Okay, next thing. So these are a few things. So what's a capability? How do we recognise what learning in one looks like? Here's the next slide. This is, this is my favourite ever slide. So many of you who've um, worked with me before will probably be bored to subs with this. But this is my poem, which summarises the definition of, um, you know, c contemporary assessment of the kind that we need um, to assess general capabilities. Um, it's actually not really a poem, it's just a colourful centre justified list, but um, <laughs> I, I think it's, um, it's fine. And if you have this conception of um, <coughs> assessment in your mind, um, that it's a process of gathering evidence, okay, so it's not an event where people do some items, right? It's a process of developing evidence, gathering evidence, to so support a judgment of the position of that person on the progression, on the scale of competence, from less competent to more competent, that you can um, use to tell what they need, where they're up to, what they need to do next. And um, the important thing is that people trust the positioning of people on that progression. And um, it's this trust that in the new metrics project and in all of our credentialing work, we're working hard to generate because we want people to understand that if you put yourself here, um, then, or if someone says you are here, that that is an accurate, reliable um, estimate of what you can actually do 
Otherwise, there's no point, is there? It will just, uh, no one will agree um, that we, um, what you want. Now, here's, here's another one of my favourite ones. This is the um, big picture. Uh, th those of you who don't know big picture, there's, there are a group of schools or academies that cater for kids, uh, particularly senior secondary kids who um, may not thrive in normal schools. They've been re operating for 15 years. They've taken at, to their heart that the thing that these kids need to do is learn to be confident, capable citizens who know how to learn and who um, are able to chart their own way in life. This is Abby, who graduated last year. This is a credential that Big Picture have put together with us that is now an official alternative to the HSC, the VCE, the SACE, or whatever, and is accepted by 15 universities as such. The key things about it that, make, that set it apart, I mean, I don't want to be critical of the VCE, but it's um, a handy comparator, the VCE, uh, this is a digital certificate for a start. So it's got a front page which has got everything summarised in it, but you can click right through to all the proper evidence of what Abby knows and can do. The um, chrysanthemum, the, the concentric circles around the chrysanthemum are standards of attainment of Abby in the general capabilities that Big Picture has set as its learning goals. What else can be said about that? Abby gets to choose some bits of what she puts on her certificate. So um, there's a fair degree of learner agency in that. I, I think this is the sort of um, profile that students really want to have, which shows what they know and can do. That could supplement or be al um, an alternative to things like the HSC. Um, Okay, where am I going with this? So I've talked to you, I've said, well, we need new metrics. And I've talked to you about how you can look at general capabilities and see how you might assess them for any student. Um, and for the last three or four years, we've been working with many schools to figure out how we can generate these assessments that can be trusted. Um, but you cannot do it with the sort of tests that you have in PISA or VCE. You've got to really do something different. And I've just put up there some of the salient points of difference about how you can generate trusted assessments of the general capabilities. And a few, let me just highlight a few of them. Obviously, you can't do it by pen and paper. You've got to actually have the students undertaking complex performances in which they can demonstrate their competence. You can't just do it in one complex performance. There needs to be multiple performances. You can't accept just the view of just one person. You've got to have multiple perspectives of the student. So you, you, we're now in the situation where we have complex performances that reflect what the student really wants to engage with, that are assessed by multiple raters, um, and these judgments are aggregated. This is quite a different approach to the sort of HSC approach. I'm, I'm sure you would agree. And this is the approach that we're really um, working hard to perfect in our new metrics and our other um, credentialing partners. I'm not going to, I could, I'm sure there are people in the audience who would want to dig down a bit more there, but I'm just going to keep on going because one of the, um, we get lots of phone calls that says, that say to people, that say to us, listen, when are the rubrics that you're doing for the general capabilities going to be ready? Because can you post them out to us? And we'll um, slap them across our kids and um, within, you know, pretty soon we're going to have profiles of them. 
And so if you can send us the rubric, say, in March, we should be able to get wonderful um, profiles by September. Right? Now, to the extent that people really believe that, then, then there is a deep misunderstanding of what this sort of approach to general capabilities actually means in a school. And I'll, t I'll tell you a couple of the reasons why. The first one is that before you can assess a student's capability, you have to give them the capacity to perform to their maximum capacity. Otherwise, you're always underestimating what they can do. When we, um, and you know, our new metric schools and others spend a lot of effort, a huge effort, it's the hardest thing to set up performance tasks that actually enable students to generate uh, or, or give them the capacity to demonstrate what they can do in these areas of competence. This is just a little statistic for you, just to whet your appetite. This, this comes from um, schools that have really worked hard to demonstrate, to provide opportunities for their students to demonstrate these capabilities. But when we um, issued the rubrics or assessment tools, we asked teachers to really say, listen, try and make an assessment of your kids, but if seriously you don't know, say so. Right? Look at what we got. For instance, in learner agency, one of the th questions was, uh, broadly, to what extent does, does this student take responsibility for their own learning? What did teachers say? I don't know. Mostly they do what I tell them to. Right? I don't actually know how much responsibility they take for their own learning. So the teachers were pre prepared to say, I don't know. And all the way through, I, when we came to assessing competence, these um, teachers were honest enough to say, we don't teach like that. How could we possibly tell if these students can do these things? We just don't teach that way. Um, and this is schools that have been trying quite hard to do it. So um, until we actually get the learning design and the assessment design and the credential design all aligned, we're not going to have valid assessments of student performance in our schools. So we've got a lot of work to do. The second precondition is that schools really <coughs> need time to do this. This is not something that can be imposed on top of a school. Um, and uh, we, we've been able to chart the trajectory that schools go through. We had uh, 15 West Australian schools um, in a room, no, 22 Australian, West Australian schools in a room the other day. And after two days of workshop, they were asked to array themselves, excellent schools, on this trajectory of um, performance. And of the um, 22, 15 of them were down here on seized by the need, right? <laughs> Two of them were up there um, at 3.5, so they were between a line curriculum and a line the assessment. And I think most of our new metric schools would say that they're up around about four and have got a few years to go before they hit five or six. So um, this, is a, this is a long range change for schools. And the last precondition is everyone's got to trust it. You know, schools can't move if the parents won't move. Um, they won't, I mean, every, every teacher in the room knows that if a student says, is this on the test? <laughs> they know what it means. So, um, you know, unless students buy it, unless parents buy it, unless employers buy it, unless universities buy it, then we're not going to move that fast. So again, the new metrics um, project or in, and projects with our partners is working out what are the preconditions for improving trust in the broader community. I can see VTAC, uh, Teresa, up there. So, <laughs> um, I mean, these are questions that we discuss with people like that because they're important. Now, um, I'm on the last leg here. Does anyone know what that is? 
It's a DC-3 aeroplane, all right? And in 1938, it revolutionised air travel. It, it, um, may, it was the first profitable airliner, in fact, and it was the tipping point between when rail and sea were the main mass transport long hauls through to aircraft, the DC-3. Now, the thing about the DC-3 is that it was a big innovation, but there was nothing innovative about it. Is that a contradiction? So um, what, it, what it actually did was it gathered together a whole pile of things that had been sort of lying around the industry <coughs> and put them together. And I'm just going to read you these because I'm not engineering minded. A variable pitch propeller, uh, retractable landing gear, flaps, and uh, this is, I'm not joking, a monocoque construction of the fuselage, um, which is aluminium cladding over a honeycomb um, strength, um, and uh, radial air-cooled engines, uh, and I think that's about it. So those five things were, were, had not, they're well known. They were pasted together, and the DC-3 became the combination of things put together that revolutionised long-haul passenger transport. Now, one of the things you may have noticed in my slides that occasionally I use, use new, new learning ambitions, new assessments, and I often put them in inverted commas, new credentials, there is nothing that I have met in my 50 years that's new about education. When I talk to people who were part of the STC certificate back before the Blackburn days, they were doing all of these sorts of things. It, it, none of these things are new. 360 degree assessments are not <coughs> new. General capabilities are not new. Aristotle would have been very happy chatting about them. These are not new things. But what I think we have the opportunity of doing now is putting together a new configuration of approaches to assessment that will enable every student, and I mean every student, to be able to experience and represent success in areas of importance to them. And this is the holy grail that we've been looking for, particularly in secondary schools, since the 1950s when we decided that mass secondary schooling was the way to go. It's something we've never achieved. But um, when I watch our new metrics partners, our credentialing partners, I look at what they're doing in the Philippines and in big picture, I'm pretty <coughs> confident that this new approach, this new configuration of old things, could well be what we're looking for to make a really qualitative difference and have success for every student in our schools. Um, Jim, I'm stopping there. Thank you. <laughs>